Hey everybody, it's me, Phil from One Wall Studio, and I'm here to talk to you guys today about a huge plugin, absolutely ludicrously, insanely big and insanely popular. I hope that you guys appreciate just how much stuff this plugin can do. If you thought limiter number six was an in-depth video, well, I shudder to think about how long this one's going to be because, oh my goodness, it is ridiculous. The plugin, as I'm sure you guys see, is TDR Nova, and, uh, well, it's 100% free. There's a gentleman's edition that has some additional features, but hopefully by the end of this, you see just how much power the free version actually has. Free version doesn't really do it justice. You can see that it's a standard edition Mach 2, and that's because, well, it's got an overhauled GUI. It's very attractive, very clean, very aesthetic, lots of controls, very easy to navigate, lots of pretty fades and all that good stuff. The original version was a lot more uh, plain, a lot more like blue lines on a white background on a grid and didn't have nearly the amount of aesthetic appeal that this one does. So as you can see, I'm going to be using version number 2.1.4. So let's jump right into this boy. First off, you should be able to see the toolbar up here which from the get-go has both an undo button and a redo button. So if you made a mistake or changed anything about the plugin while you were doing stuff and you wanted to go through its history, you would just use the undo and redo buttons and it'll actually walk you through multiple different presets. So if you change the preset, if you changed any of the configurations, sometimes bypass is enabled, sometimes it isn't. Sometimes functions are grayed out. So the redo and undo buttons navigate to previous control states. Pretty powerful undo and redo function. Right next to that, you'll see that there is a list of presets. So you can choose between them and it can give you a good idea of how the plugin works. Or at the very least, some initial states that you can use as a starting point. Now you can also scroll through these with the up and down arrows right here. And you can access advanced features by right click on the preset bar itself. Now you can't right click on the up and down arrows. It will just continue to navigate through those. But if you right click next to those arrows on the UI, you can actually set a couple of different scales. You can see how many instances are running. You can copy the state of this one and then paste it into another, or you can share the state. Now, if you were to share the state, you'd be able to actually copy and paste all of these functions in an email or to the clipboard, so you can send it directly to somebody instead of sharing a preset, which is pretty wild. Some of the options included in this advanced preset management dropdown list available through right click are reset to original state, which literally resets it to the original state of the preset. So if you made an adjustment and changed it like that, but you wanted it to reset to the original state of just the preset, you could click that and boom, you're there. You don't have to go back and forth to a preset. You can just boom, reset to original. Now you'll notice that it's actually grayed out if you're already reset to the original state. And that's to show you that you haven't made any changes. Another option is to save as a new global user preset. We'll actually let you save a user preset that persists across all sessions, all DAWs. So if you were to open up TDR Nova in a totally different DAW, say you were in Pro Tools and you wanted to move to Studio One or in Reaper and you wanted to move to Ableton, so on and so forth, or vice versa, you'd be able to save this and you just save the preset name, say edge density, nothing changed. Create the preset and boom, it's in the user defined presets. Things have changed. It looks like you can save up to 60 presets now as a user, which is pretty awesome. I always say that being able to save more is better than being able to save less, although limitations can lead to creativity. That's pretty awesome. Another option is to be able to overwrite or rename. So if I wanted to say nothing changed, but one thing, well, there's a, a limit to how long the name can be. So I would just overwrite the preset. Now it's nothing changed, but, and if I were to shake that up, I'd be able to then reset it to its original state and boom. You can also delete a selected user preset and it'll ask you, hey, do you really want to delete that? And if it's, your name is long enough, it might not even fit in the uh, UI box there. I'm going to say no because I like having a preset there. So I actually did a fresh install of this plugin so as to have nothing getting in the way of my standard workflow with it, just so that I could show it off to everybody and that everybody be working from the same clean slate. Speaking of clean slates, the copy state and paste state are totally optional here. If you wanted to just copy and paste without saving to a global user preset, you'd be able to go between windows and do that by right clicking here, hitting control C, or hitting control C and control Ving into the next window. So if you really wanted to, you could load two instances of this and just copy and paste the settings, which would be pretty easy. Or you can go to the share state here and get the exact same pop-up window as you could by right-clicking anywhere else on the UI and hitting share state. 
So there's a couple of different options there. You can get to the same thing. Up next is the AB or copy A to B buttons, which is also known as a AB comparison control. So if you were to press this button, you'd be able to copy state A to B and then adjust. And then you can go back and forth between two different states at whim. So say you wanted to adjust something with real intense DSing here and switch to this state to see if you could boost it, but still have the same amount of DSing there. And you go back and forth to decide, do I want more air, but more aggression in the dynamics control, so on and so forth. You can do that pretty easily. Now up next, you can see that you can actually toggle the display on and off, which shrinks the size of the window considerably. So if you just wanted to do this as like a parametric EQ and use nothing but the controls at the bottom, then you'd definitely be able to do that. Some people like to be able to work with less resource usage and without having to see all of the frequency stuff here because that's just distracting. They like to work with their uh, ears and not with their eyes, as they say. Uh, you can definitely do that, and that's a pretty cool option. Up next is process quality. So there's a difference between eco economic. This is the internal bandwidth of 100 kilohertz. So even eco is pretty high quality. Precise is the default, which has an internal bandwidth of 200 kilohertz. Precise plus, which is basically just precise, but it has internal non-linearity. So what that means is it's going to act a little bit more like analog. In spite of the insane bandwidth, it's going to have some non-linearities that aren't going to be easily emulatable by other EQs or even other dynamic EQs. And the other option is to set the same quality for all instances. Basically, if you're doing that, you can actually choose to have this choice be the default for any time you load TDR Nova. After that, you have the option of processing target. So if you were to go from stereo, which is the default, and change it to mono, it forces any input to mono. Interestingly enough, you can also do a sum, which means center processing, or difference, which means side processing. So this basically counts as a mid-side mode. However, if you're doing that, then you really only have the option of doing multiple instances in a row. So let's say you want to do this one just for the center or the mid. So this is now a mid-side processor, but it's only attaching itself to the mid. Then you could actually add another instance of it and have this one do the sides. So difference is basically side mode. Sum is mid mode. However, you're still going to be able to hear everything in stereo. It doesn't force anything to sum. So let's say I wanted to increase the brightness on the sides over here in the 2K region, and then I wanted to increase the mid range in the mid, but cut down on the brightness of the 2K region. You can do that and just have two instances in a row in series on whatever source you're using, whether it's the master bus or whatever. So check it out. So you can hear that it's processing just the side and just the mid separately but you can't actually do regular mid-side processing in this free version. So with that in mind, there's also multiple other options for this particular plugin when it comes to the process target. So you could also choose to either just process the left, you'd still hear it in stereo, or you could process just the right, so you have separate LR options here if you don't want to do stereo processing, but just want to do left and right. Or you could do dual mono, which will unlink the dynamics processors. So instead of doing a conventional left-right processing scheme where going stereo will let you affect basically the entire stereo image, processing both left and right at the same time, dual mono will basically look at both sides independently. Oh. You'll notice that sometimes on this spectrograph, the correlation meter is showing a little bit more cancellation on the right side than the left and vice versa. Using the delta switch here that shows you exactly what's getting canceled. So that means that unlike stereo mode, it unlinks the left and the right to be processed separately. Whereas with stereo, it would more or less be perfectly across the board with whatever correlation is already consistent. 
It's a very subtle difference. It's one that makes sense, especially if you're working with some material that has inconsistent left versus right imaging. So tones that it might be a little bit different on left and right for guitar or something with a really wide stereo image on drums where sometimes it's really harsh, but only on the right side or a lot of hard panning, you might find that dual mono will do what you want a little bit better without comping down too hard on some of the frequencies on one side that doesn't need it versus the other side, which does need it. So that's just a real interesting way to look at it. Uh, if you really want to do something like that, you absolutely could. The functionality is built in and it works fine. So after that, you've actually got the option of doing either an internal or an external side chain. If you're on Reaper, for example, you can see that the IO connectors here say input one is input left, input two is input right, and input three is side chain. So you can actually send pretty much anything, the third input on your track and have that be the side chain input. So sidechain input basically means that you're going to be able to use an external signal to drive the dynamics processing. So for example, if I wanted to take the guitar tracks, you can actually see here that it's not got the uh, sidechain activated yet. So if I were to set it to external sidechain, Increase the number of inputs to three, four in Reaper. It only lets you do stereo at any given time. You can't just do a single. And then I set the third to the side chain right here. And then I decide to send the snare track to the rhythm guitar bus and send it specifically to channels three and four. Now, every time it sees the snare hit, this is the side chain, so it's going to show you what's on the side chain. You're basically just seeing what the snare does. Now, what's cool about having an external side chain is you can actually set it because you have the option of going wideband in this. You can have it duck every single time the snare hits or you can have it set so that instead of going wideband, you only duck certain frequencies when it hits. All the while, you can actually EQ the guitar tone to be even wider or fatter or whatever. So you can actually boost the areas that are going to conflict for when it's not playing the snare. So you notice that that'll actually clean up a lot of that area in the rhythm guitars for the snare. But then when the snare is not playing, the guitars are stupid fat. Now, of course, I'm doing an extremely exaggerated effect and I would be a lot more careful with it in an actual mix. But the fact that you can do that with a side chain is extremely cool. I absolutely love it. From here, now that we know what the side chain does, you can either do internal, external, or have a flat side chain. So up next, you've got the help option, which shows you dynamic help. You can actually click on this button and it basically activates tooltips over everything you could want. So if you've got the display open, it'll show you if you pause on the display, some information about what the display does. Same with the gain knob, same with the threshold. Literally any aspect of the UI that you might be questioning, whether it's grayed out or not, you can actually learn a lot about it by having this help button. So if you want basically everything I'm doing right now to be shown to you in words, this dynamic help button may be a lot of help to you. And it even gives some cute trips and tricks like the right click context sensitive menus and some information about how certain controls work. So having a dynamic help menu is pretty awesome. Up next, we have the settings menu. In the settings menu, there are a ton of different options. You can first of all see the about page, which shows you information about who made everything, uh, 
about what build it is, which format you're using, the version number, and going up from the bottom, you can actually see the user manual, the official video tutorial, which I'll be honest, this isn't that. <laughs> this is an unofficial video tutorial where I just want to go as in-depth as possible about it. You can actually report any bugs on your system. So if the plugin keeps crashing or if it's not doing the things you think it should, if it's not turning stuff on or if you're clicking on things and it's not moving, you can report a bug there. You can also get help from the support staff and I'm sure that they'd be more than happy to help you out. You can also actually check for updates in the newer versions and you can see whether or not your product's up to date, when the last time you searched for updates was. If there is an update, you can download it here and you can actually set automatic update checks. Now, I actually don't really have those very often on my plugins because when I'm working on stuff, I don't want it to tell me that I need an update. But it is good to have just in case you want the latest, greatest fixes or if you previously reported a bug and they said to wait for the next update. Other options include local data management, which includes all of your preferences, export it with any keys that you have, presets, preferences. You can move it to another computer and then you can import that zip file with all of that data. Now, the problem is if you were to do that and you were to have basically presets saved already on the system that you wanted to import your new zip into, that would actually get rid of any old presets that you had and replace them all with whatever presets there were at the time of export saved to whatever heckin folder you want and then dragged wherever. So this was actually a really big help for me when I was moving over to my Linux system. I was moving from my Mac mobile rig to my Linux one and exporting this zip made importing all of my settings extremely easy and I didn't have to rebuild all of my configuration options and all that. So it's pretty awesome. And if you have other Tokyo Dawn Records plugins, then this will also affect those. So you want to be careful about that. If you've already set up a whole bunch of other plugins but only need Nova, then it may behoove you to just copy and paste a lot of the presets or save them as global presets and then export those and just, you know, maybe get rid of the other stuff. <laughs> you can also go and look at the processing information. Now, this is actually incredible. So this plugin will show you how many samples of latency, what the IO sample rate is. So if your DAW isn't showing you immediately what the sample rate is on the project or in the rendering engine, this will, which is pretty wild. So you can actually get a very specific amount of samples on here. So even though I have 256 SPL buffer cache set right now, this is showing me that this plugin is using exactly 184 samples. Absolutely nuts. And then you have the highest quality rendering option. If you enable this, no matter what kind of quality is set here, whether it's precise, precise plus or eco, when you render and it sees offline rendering, then it'll automatically default to the highest possible quality, which I, I think would be precise plus. Then you also have the option for a graphic scales and frame rate adjustment, 100 FPS, which might be a little bit low for G-Sync if you got like 144 hertz or whatever, but being able to go 60, 70, etc., or lower for a system like my old MacBook Pro, then frame rate's definitely going to want to be of uh, some kind of assistance to you because it's pretty awesome to be able to actually choose that stuff instead of being limited to, well, it's really pretty, but it's going to suck on your system or, oh, it's really ugly and it runs pretty OK. Those choices are always awesome. And this UI scale is actually great for a default, but you can also adjust the size over here in the bottom right corner of the plugin by clicking on these little boxes right here. So if you were to adjust it this way, you could actually increase or decrease the size at will and it would adjust pretty much the entire screen size and all the elements involved. Some other options include whether or not you want your continuous drag to have velocity or be completely linear, drag sensitivity. You can configure it to invert left and right, which is pretty awesome. Add it somebody else's studio and you just can't swap buttons. Well, at the very least, if you're using their mouse and you prefer that they be switched, you can set it on here for this one plugin. So that's something, I guess. But it is cool to have the option in all honesty. Now, the final option that you have is to support the developers. And if you click on this heart, you can actually go to a web page where it asks you if you want to buy a TDR Nova GE for, you know, 60 pounds, it looks like. It includes the ability to do smart operations and a whole bunch of other stuff. So even though this isn't a sales pitch for it, if you love TDR Nova, the free version, then chances are the Gentleman's Edition is just going to be so much more powerful for you. Resonance removal akin to Soothe in some ways. I've seen it compared to that. Basically, you have a ton more options than you do in this one, but the power and functionality 
is still there. So I would definitely recommend checking that out if you love this one. So you may have already noticed, but on the display, the left side shows the overall frequency magnitude with a yellow curve. So this yellow curve here is going to show you how many dB of gain you're adding, which is also noticeable by this adjustable boy right here, this knob. You can see that they are directly tied. You can adjust the frequency by moving it left to right, holding down the left click and dragging it. And this correlates to the decibel amount on the left side. Right clicking on any of these buttons in the display will switch between the three different filter types that you can use, whether that's a low shelf, a bell curve, or a high shelf. You can also scroll to adjust the cue. If your cursor is on top of the band itself, then you'll be able to scroll up and down to adjust that cue. Left click to drag, right click to change what type of bell curve it is, and you're good to go with left and right clicks here. Now, the other options that are distinct from that are all about the blue lines. So if you were to turn on the threshold down here, you'd be able to see that it actually shows a blue line that represents the threshold over the frequency. So the blue area will show the response to that frequency. So adjusting the threshold will bring that down. Adjusting the ratio adjusts how much it, uh, it reacts from totally infinity to one, which would make it a perfect limiter, all the way down to one and even lower so you can actually do expansion with it so you can just boost that signal and double clicking can get rid of it get rid of a band or create a band so if you wanted to turn all of the bands off you could double click and bring new bands, but it would save the settings depending on the band number. You can then order by frequency and it will change the band number. You could solo a band, which will show you just the audio controlled by the band. And you'll be able to hear every change you make to just that band. You can also right click anywhere on the display and adjust the source of the analyzer, which has the same effect as using the source buttons on the right side. So the spectral analyzer does need a source. You could actually turn it off and not see anything. Or you could set the input as the default. The output. So if you were to raise the high end by a significant amount, you'd be able to see the difference. And since it's got the internal side chain, the input is the same as the side chain in this case. You could also turn it off if you'd like, but if you're gonna have this display on, you might as well have the input on because input or output on, depending on your workflow. I tend to prefer output because what's the point of having this display if you're not gonna actually use it? So some other cool features are you can adjust the timing, which I'm pretty sure this is something that you can only actually do by right clicking on the analyzer itself. I don't think there's a way that you can show any other settings for this timing on the actual visual. So when you adjust the timing, you can make it fast, normal, or original. All right, but you can't get it too slow. So like span, you can actually get it to be very smooth and very slow, which is my preference. Whereas this one's a little bit more fast and a little bit quicker no matter what you choose. The other option is you can set the range from 48 dB to 96 dB, which you can literally see a noise floor at that point. So even though your only choices are 48 dB and 96 dB, it's still pretty interesting to be able to see that. And you'll notice that this scale on the right changes when you do that. So that's 
negative 90 dB right there in the high end. So you can actually see if there's any noise on your track. And if there is, well, you can fix it, presumably. Or you could just, yeah, so that's going to be where that boost is. I've got some plugin that's generating a little bit of noise in that high end, but it's not a problem because it's actually really low. The other thing is, instead of having to right click here and change the range this way, you can just left click on the range itself on the side and it'll change the scale just completely and immediately. So that's pretty cool. There's a couple of different ways to do a lot of that stuff. You can also adjust the UI scale from here. Although I prefer something a little bit less egregious, but for the sake of this video, I'm going to keep it at about 125 just to make it easier for everybody to see. Now, some of the other things you can do are complete bypass of the plugin. It applies to both EQ and dynamics including the wideband, and you'll see that it kind of freezes there. But you can unbypass it at any time and hear the difference that you see. With that, you can actually also click on the individual names of the bands, turn them on and off by clicking here in this transport area. You can see the name of the addition that you have, which is cool over here on the left. You can band a solo again, which is a great option, and you can order by frequency. You can also use GR Delta, which is a little different than band soloing. So if you band solo, you hear the whole frequency band that you're affecting, but you're hearing it the way it's going to be in the mix. So that band is exactly the same way it is in the mix. However, if you use GR Delta instead, you hear just what you're changing about the mix. So if I were to turn off the wide band, you'd only be hearing this little bit of compression and this wider compression right here on the low end band. So you're really only hearing a little bit of like 50 Hertz, 100 Hertz and like 1.5K. Literally just the parts that are being affected. So that's a really cool function. So that gain reduction delta thing that you see, you can do a lot with that and it can really help you focus in on just the stuff you want to get rid of. So what I like to do is I like to band solo stuff. Find a resonance. And then GR Delta it. So that I can make sure that everything I've gotten rid of is a frequency I don't like. Unfortunately, you can't hear what you're adding with EQ. You can only hear the difference in the gain reduction. So if you boost this band ridiculously, you'll hear it in the mix, but not in the GR Delta because it's only looking for gain reduction. It's not looking for EQ changes. So using a combination of those tools is really what's gonna help you the most. So it doesn't matter how much you boost or cut, the only thing you're hearing is how much it's getting compressed. So there's a lot of power with that GR Delta there. And as always, if you make a lot of changes and then you don't like how it sounds or you like how it sounds, but you want to make sure that it sounds good, you can bypass it and then go, oh, wow. I think I need to rework some stuff, at which point reset to original state, baby. That's the one. <laughs> All right. So the other options that you have here for maximum power you're going to want to look at the filters. So filters typically come before or after the EQ. And in this case, it's important to notice that you have a single high pass and a single low pass filter. So this high pass, you can either have 6 dB per octave, 12 dB per octave, 24 or 72 dB per octave, which makes the cut much harsher. Now you can also cycle through those by using the scroll wheel on the band itself on the display if you're using the display area. And the same applies to the low pass. Now, the high pass goes from 10 hertz 
all the way up to 40 kilohertz, which is insane. You can literally high pass everything. There is no limit. And the same applies to the low pass. So if you're going to low pass, you can go anywhere from 40 kilohertz, which probably isn't going to be doing much, all the way down to 10 hertz, which would be definitely doing a lot. So you want to make those both 72 dB cuts. You can actually hear them. You can click and drag the numbers. The slope, you can turn them on and off with these buttons. You can drag it here. You can do pretty much anything. The only thing that I don't believe you can do in the free version is make this a resonant band. So you have to basically just use the uh, slope as it is prescribed to you here and make the choice of how hard you want it and how soft you want it, etc. The other interesting thing is if you were to mix up the low pass and the high pass, It does some nasty stuff where it band passes all the things you high passed already. However, it only band passes up to 10K. And down to about 20, I believe. 20 Hertz. So that's a really weird function, but it has to happen that way. Otherwise, things would just disappear totally when you high pass and low pass. And again, you can see that with the output on. You're literally creating a band pass with the filters. And it works both ways. It's literally insane. But that kind of functionality is just so cool. Up next, let's talk about what each individual band options there are besides the Q frequency. Let's talk about the compression aspect of it. So let's solo this band real quick, adjust the Q, which not only adjusts the EQ Q, but also the compression Q. So if you've got this simple bell curve right here, Now you can adjust the ratio to have a ton, a little, basically also have upward expansion. And you'll see based on the icon here, if you're using the display, whether or not it looks like it's going upward and it pulls the icon up or you're compressing all the way down and it presses down. You also have these attack and release options and a threshold. So nothing over this threshold may pass. And the attack goes from 0.10 milliseconds all the way up to 500 milliseconds, which probably wouldn't be doing a lot. And the release goes from 10 milliseconds all the way up to three seconds. So you're not quite going to get LA-2A style release here, but what you are going to be able to get is a wide range of options. You could maybe get an 1176 style uh, speed out of this by maybe choosing... 0.25 milliseconds and a release of like 250 milliseconds and then just adjusting from there. So now I basically have like an 1176 style thing right on this one band. So an 1176 on the whole mix, but only from like 100 hertz up to 1k based on this Q. That's really going to be doing some cool stuff. So you can open things up a little bit with some really crazy compression scenarios. One thing you can also do, just keep in mind, you can use this on every track, not just the master. You can set it to a high shelf and let me get up to some of these vocals real quick. So on these vocals, I'm already using RDSer. So RDSer is just catching S's and harsh sibilants over 7.1k. So what we can do here is the exact same thing. Instead of using RDSer, I can have a lot more control over how the band acts, how it operates, and I can boost some of that airiness. So 7.1k, I'm actually going to boost into it. I'm going to adjust the threshold. 
nice and embracing the sun with arms like nets. Cast out from the darkness, impossible adventures await us now. So you have way more control over so much of this stuff with a free plugin versus RDS, or which I hate to say it, but I paid like a hundred bucks for back in the day. So this can compensate for the issues with DSer. You can really bring things back up. You can adjust the cue, have it tighter, have it cut a little bit of the brightness behind it. You can do a lot more with this band and bring all that air back in, adjust the attack and release, give it more of an LA-2A pump to it if you were to adjust that high frequency thing. Have it as fast or slow as you need. Now, that's some really cool stuff. You can have a makeshift de and it works pretty much just as good. And you can bring that air back. So I actually think this sounds way better than rd -er because you're able to boost and cut with compression, which makes it dynamic because it's dynamic EQ, you have so much more control over how it works. And I love that. The other thing to notice is that you have the wideband option. So if you wanted to, you could use this presumably on a master bus. You could use it on a bus, you could use it on the master, you could use it on pretty much any group of things. So I'm gonna get rid of all these bands and just use the wideband here. So in order to easily do that, you can literally just go to any one of the bands and then just click off of it. So once you've unclicked that, it doesn't matter if they're on or off. This little area will show you what bands are currently on. And if you just click out of that or click down here, pretty much anywhere on the element, that's the easiest way to find your overall wide band. And you can't add anything else because you're limited to the four bands in the free version, but that's more than enough for us. So let's say you wanted to do some limiting on your master bus. Well, you actually can. You can have a really fast attack and release, like really fast. You'd probably maybe not have as fast a release as you want if you're used to something like L1 or, I don't know, L2. But what I can say is that it's still pretty, pretty useful. And with the GR Delta, you can just hear what's causing gain reduction. So if you wanted to adjust an element in the mix with top-down mixing, this is a great way to figure out how you want to do that and see what's triggering your thing. Boost the input gain rather into it. You can make your mix a lot louder. And because it's always going to be loudness matched, as long as you have this EQ gain here, you can actually hear what it's doing to the signal and how much you can get away with. Then if you wanted to adjust that until it's relatively neutral sounding, Keep in mind that once you turn that loudness matching off, it's gonna just sound louder no matter what. But the options are all here for having a really punchy bus compressor slash mixed bus compressor, like whatever you want, especially with all of the side chaining options. Now, another thing to note is that you can actually adjust the dry mix. So you could have parallel compression. Just blend in what you want. If you want this much crunch. It's 
and you get that little bit of punch there. So there's a lot of options here with this dry mix control because you can actually use it as a parallel compressor and a parallel dynamic EQ. You can actually do a lot of really cool stuff with this plugin. Just another thing to mention is that there's an output gain knob here. So even if you're EQ gained, you can adjust the output gain here and it'll show you how much you have to go until you're at that level. So EQ gain will show you with this little blue notation right around the UI element right here, how much gain it's compensating. So it's turning it down by about eight dB, which makes a lot of sense because the gain on the wideband is eight and a half dB. So if I were to adjust this, it would bring down the overall gain to three dB, at which point I could adjust the output gain to about three dB. So I'm always able to get a pretty comprehensive look at how much I'm actually doing with this plugin. It's totally fantastic. So you can always see these meters are pretty much full of information that you can use at any given time, and it's amazing. So you're gonna crush the crap out of that, and it would still sound pretty dope in parallel. So EQ matching is a great way to use this processor. I like to keep that on and then turn it off after I've made absolutely sure that every choice I've made is a good one. It usually doesn't take very long either because the workflow of this plugin is so fast. Now, just as a fun aside, there's also some hidden functionality with that wideband compression, and that is even though everything is affected by it, you can actually do some magic here. So the threshold here on this band is acting as a de-esser slash airband safety mechanism. But let's say I don't want that to be triggered by the master band. Let's say, for all intents and purposes, I want this wide band to act more like an LA-2A and just kind of roll off the high in its uh, sidechain. Check this out. I hold Alt and I can click on the threshold and now it's sticky mode. So this band will now completely ignore the wide band compression. Whereas this doesn't, and this one doesn't. This is affected by both its own compression and the wideband compression. But this one is only affected by its own compression. And what that has the added benefit of doing is the wideband now pretty much entirely ignores this top end. So now the wideband applies to everything except this high shelf, which affects everything above like six and a half K, but it's a little bit more than that because the roll off is from two K up to six K and then beyond. So with that alt click thing, you can literally have so much control over even the wideband compression. It's not even funny. And this is a free plugin guys. Like that is amazing. The other thing is you can adjust threshold, but also WB button actually has, instead of being in split mode where all of these ratios are controlled by the independent channels uh, ratio and release and attack and release, all that independent stuff, you can actually change it to follow the detector input of the wideband and have all of its settings. So.
So instead of using its own ratio, its own speed, all that, it'll actually just use the wide bands ratio control. And that's called switching between split mode and W band mode. So if split mode's disabled, then you have the W band processing settings. And if you have this enabled, then they'll have that little gray rectangle right there to show you that all of the settings for this band are now controlled by the settings of the wide band processor. So it's just another way to affect all of this change in the plug. And it's really cool. So you can have it either follow the wide band and just further emphasize that with its own threshold or have its own settings, own threshold, ratio, and release. And you can hear the difference there. It's definitely night and day. So hopefully, <laughs> in all of this madness, I haven't forgotten anything. I believe I've done pretty much everything I can to break down how this plugin works and how you can use it to further get an incredible sounding mix with lots of movement. And if you want to know how you can use it, well, uh, you can use it in any way you desire. You could use it on the master bus to basically just do the old fashioned pop music thing where you've got this boost up here. But it doesn't become too unwieldy because if it does, then it becomes automatically clamped down on. Which, even though it's very clearly different, if I were to adjust this... Boom. You can really open up a master with this without overpowering it. Because it's literally just EQing the track to bring it down a little bit when there's too much bass and too much treble, but you're still opening up everything. So you're creating this effect where you're adding in all this stuff to really hype the track, but then it's clamping down when that effect becomes too much. And it's really up to you when that happens. So one easy thing I like to do with Nova, just to give you a good example, is I like to use it on lead guitar tracks so that they fit in the mix real clean. And I don't have to use anything other than the guitars processing, which would be the amp, all that stuff into TDR Nova and then into a limiter. So let me just play with this a little bit. So it maintains the character of the original track, but I got rid of a lot of that fuzzy resonance. And I also opened it up a little bit more to the air. So even though it's super fuzzy, it's got a lot of big muff in it, the control that I'm able to get with three moves of EQ and then one little bit of threshold adjustment for each of these is pretty staggering. Also, it looks like a lot, but it's really not because I have it zoomed in with the scale. So it's never doing more than 6 dB of reduction in any particular area, but I'm also boosting that air. So it really helps me clean it up, but also, you know, scoop it out a little bit, but only when it's bad. So then when it gets to the higher notes...
it reacts differently to each band because now it's in a totally different area. Those are the things that I like to do. I think it's awesome on bass for controlling resonances. I think it's amazing on drums for cleaning out really woofy areas, but with a slightly slower attack so that you get that initial impact and then it sucks it back in just a little bit so that it's not taking up all that space after the hit happens. Like, there's a lot of options. Do what you want with TDR Nova, but just know you can do a whole lot with it before anything even comes remotely close to sounding bad because it's such a clean, powerful tool. And I can guarantee you, it's going to be hard to get bad results with it, <laughs> even if you try, because it's just so smooth, so transparent, and it works wonders. And you can make all kinds of crazy looking EQ curves like this and still have it sound amazing. Use it to clean up your mid-range in a track that's already been processed, if you're a mastering engineer, maybe. But at the end of the day, it's a free tool. You owe it to yourself to at least go out and check it out and try it at least once. And if you have any questions, comments, concerns, please feel free to leave some in the comment section below. I'm Phil Zio from Wall Studio. I uh, don't know if I've ever said this before, but if you could give me a like and comment below so that I know that you're engaged. Give me a good old fashioned subscription, maybe ring the bell. I don't know. I don't upload nearly enough for it to make a difference, but I really appreciate it. The music today was music from my band, Mechafil. Go ahead and give us a look. That's M-E-K-A. A P H I L. That's Mecca from Mecca and Perfect's YouTube channel and Phil from One Wall Studio. And I'm happy to have finally come back and done another review. If you guys have any suggestions for what I should do in the future, let me know. All right. Thank you very much. And I'll see you guys next time. See you later. <laughs>